This is my new invention for getting through traffic jams. I'm calling it a horse. There's still a few bugs in it, and there's also a few bugs on it. As a matter of fact, this invention is also very good for drawing flies. That is, if you enjoy that sort of thing. Here you are, eat this. Okay, jockey, take him away. Scram. You know, if there hadn't been a horse, the automobile would have had nothing to replace. And that great American romance between a man and his car might never have gotten started. It began back in the days when commercials were what was pasted on the outside of barns and livery stables. Of course, if you think that romance was all magnolias and orange blossoms, then you've never been around a livery stable. Especially on a hot day. Well, I'll look at my commercial and and you can take a look at yours. Our beloved affair with the automobile started so far back that if you can remember it, it's a way past your bedtime. It was a real love affair, one that changed our whole way of life and is still doing it. I was a kind of a Stutz Bearcat man myself. That romance has left indelible scars on my arm, my elbow, and my kneecap. Those were just a few of the spots where the crank hit me. Anyway, it was 1896. There were only about 16 cars in the whole United States then. So they didn't really replace many horses, but they did come close to replacing the, the elephant, and the giraffe, and the tattooed lady. In fact, in order to see one, you had to go to the circus where they had a horseless carriage on display, along with all the rest of the freaks. Frankly, the first automobile didn't find a ready place in our hearts. In fact, it inspired downright hostility. These noisy, smoking, stink wagons, said an angry farm journal, are designed to frighten to death anything they can't flatten out. The very sight of one is enough to dry up a whole dairy herd. There ought to be a law, they said, and they dreamed of some dillies. One read, a man of mature age and judgment, mounted on horseback and carrying a red flag, must precede any self-motor machine. This warning device made the horse the first all-purpose automobile accessory. Anti-automobile societies lobbied for laws designed to make motoring downright impossible. One said, any self-propelled vehicle must come to a complete halt upon approaching a crossroad. The engineer must thoroughly examine the roadway ahead and sound his horn vigorously. Then hello loudly or ring a gun. After which he must fire a gun of sufficiently audible caliber to be heard at great distance. Thereupon he will dismount and discharge a Roman candle, Vesuvius bomb, or some other explosive device as final warning of his approach.
Highway robbery is being authorized by this law, complained one pioneer motorist, because if you obeyed it, they could put the arm on you for disturbing the peace, Sabbath breaking, illegal transportation of explosives, and discharging firearms within town limits. Politicians continue to protect the interests of horses. They believe that the horse would get the vote before women did. In one state, the driver of a car which frightened a team into bolting could be fined up to $100 for each runaway mile. If the horse balked at passing the car altogether, the law required the operator to discharge his passengers. Then he had to convince the horse that the car was really not there by covering it with a cloth painted to resemble the surrounding countryside. For the benefit of any self-respecting horse with an IQ high enough to recognize a camouflage car, the law further specified that the driver had to take his machine apart as rapidly as possible and conceal the pieces in the grass at the side of the road. but they certainly infuriated people, which probably explains why the horse never did get the vote. While motorists were cussing horses and searching through the weeds for missing carburetors, the New York Times editorialized. Americans will never learn to love the mechanical wagon because they will never get used to speeding along the road behind nothing. The medical journal predicted, if the machine ever attains the unlikely speed of 80 miles an hour, it will have to drive itself, for the human brain will be incapable of controlling it. This turned out to be one of the most accurate predictions ever made. There was no immediate danger, though. Few cars could go faster than 40. Anything over 15 was called furious driving. It was death-defying and also illegal. Some communities not only had secret speed limits, but they changed them without notice and profited by their enforcement at ambush toll stations known as scorching traps. The motor car was being treated like the new girl in town. After the initial curiosity, hostility set in. Clergyman pointed out that their use was not sanctioned by either the Old or the New Testaments. And politicians were still after the horse vote. If we cannot barricade our streets against these snorting, hissing demons, then we had better enlarge our hospitals for their victims and our penitentiaries for their drivers. The fire that blackened the city of San Francisco did the same for the reputation of the motor car. Someone started the rumor that they were used exclusively to evacuate the aristocrats of Knob Hill. When it was pointed out that these machines were mostly used for relief and rescue work, few people listened. After all, horses' carriages weren't even an American invention. Their origin was European. And they even had an ugly French name, automobile. Their drivers were called chauffeurs. Besides, they permitted a shameless flaunting of stocking when boarding them, which was downright Parisian. It's small wonder, moralized the family paper, that ladies of the ensemble and other flashy theatrical types prefer this type of vehicle. Its machinery is activated by a material which burns not unlike brimstone. also being denounced as rich men's toys, playthings for the few and the very few, devil wagons in which our wealthy and flannel samurai were hurtling down the primrose path of privilege at 20 miles to the hour. The 
president of Princeton, Woodrow Wilson, said, nothing has spread socialistic feeling more than the use of the automobile. They are a picture of arrogance and wealth with all its independence and carelessness. If the voting booth was still a safe refuge for men, the road was not. Women were learning to drive. Mrs. Hamilton Fish was learning to drive. Unaware of his place in history, a man stepped into her path. He was thoroughly intersected three times by the same car, making him the most, if not the first pedestrian, to be run over. The automobile age had really arrived. In those early years, it hardly seemed that America had a consuming passion for the automobile. It certainly wasn't love at first sight. Of course, the horse thief who ran this livery stable didn't mind picking up a quick buck selling gasoline by the quart. It was usually commercial spot remover, and its octane rating was just a little higher than kumquat juice. But it did get you up to the nearest creek, where incidentally I've been for the past 20 years. That was where you had to go to fill your radiator, because it was believed that no horse would drink at a trough which had watered an automobile. While the motor car was still considered only for the rich and the ritzy, the average American just had to admire anything that could beat him on his bicycle. In fact, do you know what first began to make the car popular? The same thing that made some girls popular. They got a reputation for being fast, speed and sport. You didn't have to be a Vanderbilt to appreciate those. The drivers were wealthy amateurs, and most of the cars were European. And the race started at 5 in the morning. Despite that, 25,000 spectators showed up for the first Vanderbilt Cup race in 1904. A 90-horsepower Panhard, a French car, won the Cup by scorching around the 300-mile course at an average of 52 breathtaking miles an hour. Most of the entries didn't even finish. The crowd kept getting in the way of the cars, and the race had to be stopped. The climb for the clouds was an eight-mile road race up Mount Washington, a race against gravity and the hoots of the disbelievers. Said one, I saw rigs called Pope Hartford, Pierce Great Arrow, Maxwell, and Locomobile. On a 30% grade, a mechanician would jump out and provide one gear lower than first, making them all pushmobiles. But rooters were beginning to outnumber hooters. We've got auto machines which, when they are perfected up to their promise, will go uphill faster than a horse with his tail on fire. Ormond Beach, Florida was the ultimate proving ground for speed. By 1906, Americans had 75 different makes of cars to choose from. They argued for the internal explosion motor. The Stanley Steamer, the flying tea kettle, ran the course at a world's record, 127 miles an hour. It would take four years for that record to be broken by a gasoline burner, driven by a cocky little man with a dead cigar, Barney Oldfield. He was no gentleman driver. Game had gotten too dangerous for amateur road races. Oldfield was a professional gear jammer who barnstormed the country's day trip. He really popularized the sport. They dropped the green flag in Indianapolis on the face of the big ones in 1911, the Memorial Day 500. This grueling run around the brickyard demanded so much of man and machine that it became a laboratory for testing new ideas for the infant automotive industry. But except for the expert and dedicated fans, the six and a half hour race was monotonous. The morbidly curious had come to see sudden death driving the black entry. The first Indianapolis 500 race, one dead, four injured. Laboratory results, the introduction of the rear view mirror. But danger was not enough to popularize the automobile. It would have to prove Yankee virtuous. That is, you know, practical. Road tests, reliability runs like the Glidden Tour, were always for owners of stock cars. 
whole cavalcade strung out over the roads, not racing each other, but the clock. Their object, to see how far an ordinary car could travel before sundown or breakdown. One covered in 20 miles in one day. The police and the Secret Service were no longer uneasy when the press of the automobile. The press commended the courage of the rough rider who publicly forsook the horse. But what gave the automobile its final stamp of respectability was when the local doctor got one. Now everyone in the car, mass production methods and go-getter advertising were America's only major contribution to the automotive industry. But even by 1912, they gave us world leadership. Every sewing machine and bicycle factory was building cars. We now had over a hundred makes to choose from, powered by everything from compressed air to rubber bands. Travel in white gloves, go electric, no fuss, no fumes, as quiet as a pussycat's bar. <laughs> Guaranteed not to go faster than 20 miles an hour. But the electric runabout would only run about 25 miles before its batteries needed recharging. And besides, it was not as claimed easier to push than a baby carriage. risk electrocution, said the competition. The machine that steams is the car of your dreams. The only auto which will cross the country on four dollars worth of kerosene, and the only one which can also blow out clog drains, thaw out fire hydrants, and roast peanuts. The ads didn't mention that it was constantly thirsty, that it always looked as if it was about to explode, and though it had no gears, it sometimes throttled itself automatically into reverse. The internal combustion engine generated not only the power of at least 16 horses, but also the warmth of eternal affection. But while we had flighted with the others, it was Lizzie. Lizzie the gas buggy we finally fell for. Times have certainly changed, admitted a rural paper. If, as Mr. Edison says, the horse is the poorest motor ever made, with an efficiency of only 2% compared to 35% for the gasoline motor, then the days of old Dobbin are indeed numbered. No longer will the liveryman hide the blade of a cross-cut saw on the road, nor the farmer encourage his children to sprinkle the byway with broken lamp chimneys. They knew now that the automobile is the real article and is here to stay. The day of its harassment is over forever. We sang blithely about automobile bubbling through life together and started out on the long honeymoon with our new sweetheart. If she had any fault, it was a slight crankiness. The newest craze was called touring, going places. There were no road maps. Special auto guidebooks gave point-to-point -point directions by landmarks, along with stern advice. Don't forget repair parts, medical chest, pocket filter, rope, block and tackle. Also an axe, shovel, gun, and compass. One of the places to go was the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. It could take as long as 60 days from New York by car. The fair celebrated the joining of our two oceans by a canal. But between our two coasts, there was still no road.
besides popularizing the Japanese kimono, the 1915 fair motivated the completion of the Lincoln Highway, our first direct transcontinental thoroughfare. Now that we could go places, there weren't enough places to go. The pleasure resort industry doubled and doubled again as the automobility expanded to include people of moderate income and limited leisure. The machine which made exercise unnecessary also made it popular and profitable. One town struck gold by drilling 18 holes in a dry pasture and advertising accessible to everyone, rolling green fields over which you can ramble and hit things. Golfing is healthier than the tango. And easier. Anyone who ever kills snakes can do it. The slogan, See America First, sold as many automobiles as it did railroad tickets. But to see parts of it, first you had to find them. Most roads were unmarked, and getting lost was a regular stop on every itinerary. The people who built the roads were often the only ones who knew where they went. By making them accessible, the automobile practically created the priceless reserves of our national park system. My children are getting an education through the windshield, said one tourist. But another, seeing a geyser, said, shucks. I've got a radiator that did better than that all the way from Altoona. To sum up touring statistically, in 1924, 1,400,012 people motored a distance of 4,683,000 miles to feed 32 bears. In 1923, two popular magazine articles, Whatever Became of the Horse and How to Travel with Pets. The automobile was changing the city. Square curb corners were being rounded so autos could turn easily. Fewer horses were seen on the street, and therefore fewer English sparrows. Some predicted they would all disappear like lobster dinners for a dollar. And uh, Austrian archdukes. Opponents of the Hohenzollern family came by the truckload. Pleasure driving was considered unpatriotic. Overnight, the popular finish for new cars became olive drab. An already booming automotive industry mobilized, tooled up for new models. Command cars, armored cars, trucks, tractors, ambulances, tanks, and engines for airplanes. Princeton's President Wilson was now America's president. Machines which he once feared would spread socialism were now being asked to deliver democracy. Stable call became just an echo. An old red leg artilleryman muttered, they're putting mule soldiers on kitty cars. The army's going to hell on a rubber tired hack. Well, if the army never got there, at least they were brought close enough to feel the heat. Back home to help the overburdened railroads, ambulances were being delivered under women power to points of embarkation. No one would joke about woman drivers. Not at St. Mihail, the Argonne, Bellow Woods. Getting unwrapped from those spiral parties was the first thing on the list with the demobilized doughboy. The third thing was to get a new car. The auto industry, already in high gear from the war, went into overdrive. Volume went up, prices down. With more than 300 radiator medallions to choose from, by 1923, there were two cars for every three families in America. Almost half of them were Model Ts.